In this video, we'll begin exploring the different types of interstellar medium. We have emission, reflection, atomic, molecular, and planetary nebulae, as well as supernova remnants. We'll first take a look at the first four items in this list, and then we'll cover planetary nebulae and supernova remnants in the next unit where we discuss the various paths of stellar evolution. Of the types of ISM that we'll cover in this video, these two are visible to us and can be easily photographed and observed, but these two are invisible and require roundabout ways of detection. Let's find out why. The first type of ISM that we'll look at is the emission nebula, otherwise known as an H2 region. These emission nebulae are clouds of interstellar hydrogen that have been energized by the nearby O and B type stars that their temperature has risen to 10,000 Kelvin, meaning the hydrogen atoms in these clouds are most likely singly ionized. Where you would normally see the notation H plus in chemistry indicating an atom of ionized hydrogen, astronomers use the Roman numeral two instead since the Roman numeral one indicates neutral hydrogen. Since a vast majority of the ISM, about 75%, is hydrogen, we see it a lot. In the visible spectrum, we see the light predominantly from the H-alpha Balmer line at 656 nanometers, so these nebulae primarily appear red. This image of the Sol Nebula in the constellation Cassiopeia is actually a composite image from three separate emission wavelengths, red from hydrogen, yellow from sulfur, and blue from oxygen. We can also see here the outer edges of the Lagoon Nebula are distinctly red, indicating that there are atoms of ionized hydrogen present in these regions. Generally, these nebulae are not as bright and colorful as we've seen in the previous two images. Most astronomical objects that we see these days are photographed with long exposure times, like this picture here of the North American and Pelican Nebulae, which was photographed by superimposing 69 individual two-minute long exposures for a total exposure time of 138 minutes, allowing for much more lights to be collected than if we were to just look at this object with the naked eye. This procedure helps make these objects look brighter, and processing them through various programs on the computer helps produce the vibrant images that we see today. Take, for example, the Rosette Nebula, an emission nebula in the constellation Monoceros. The signature red color associated with H2 regions may not be immediately noticeable in this short exposure image, but if we keep the camera shutter open for a longer period of time, we can begin to see the crisp details that give this emission nebula its very fitting name. Another example is this wide field view of two very famous objects, the Horsehead Nebula and the Orion Nebula. Parts of the Orion Nebula are categorized as emission nebula, and while the Horsehead Nebula itself is generally categorized as a dark nebula, it is silhouetted against the outer edges of the larger star-forming emission nebula called IC434. Since the Orion and Horsehead Nebulae are such favorites for astrophotographers to photograph, the variations that we see in images of these nebulae are a direct result of the photographer's preferences and their photo processing decisions. The second type of interstellar medium is called a reflection nebula. The dust in the ISM can reflect and scatter light from nearby stars. In the case of a reflection nebula, this energy from the nearby stars is not enough to fully ionize the gases in the nebula to create emission nebulae like the ones we were just looking at, but it is enough to give sufficient scattering to make this dust visible. Of the various wavelengths of light that can get scattered, the shorter wavelengths are scattered the most, so we see these nebulae looking very blue, much like our daytime skies. Reflection nebulae can often be found close to emission nebulae. Here we revisit the Lagoon Nebula, but now we're focused on the central region instead. Not only does it have the characteristic blue color of a reflection nebula, it is also encased by an emission nebula around its outer edges that we were previously focusing our attention on before. One of the most common examples of a reflection nebula is the blue glow surrounding the seven stars or the seven sisters of the Pleiades Cluster. This group of stars, located in the Taurus constellation, is thought to be passing through a cloud of interstellar dust, causing this distinctly blue glow that we see around the stars. Now this image is an example of two things. Obviously a reflection nebula, since we're still on that topic, but also of a concept called pareidolia, which is the natural tendency to see patterns and images in objects where, in fact, there are none. 
The pareidolia explains the name for this particular reflection nebula, the Witch Head Nebula. Found near the star Rigel in the Orion constellation, the Witch Head Nebula glows blue not only because of Rigel's own blue color reflecting off of the dust in the nebula, but also because the dust itself reflects the blue light more efficiently than it does the red. We saw before how reflection nebulae can often be found near emission nebulae. That is exactly what we'll see here when we look at the Trifid Nebula, located some 5,000 light years away in the constellation Sagittarius. The bright pink or red light comes from the ionized hydrogen gas in the nebula, and the blue glow is the reflection nebula scattering the light from the nearby stars. The third type of interstellar medium is the atomic nebula. These are invisible, cool gas clouds composed of neutral hydrogen atoms, which are the hydrogen atoms that have not been energized enough to actually experience electron transitions. Remember that if ionized hydrogen was referred to as H2 by astronomers, these neutral hydrogen clouds are H1 regions. Without any electron transitions, these hydrogen atoms cannot emit any visible light. So how do we see them? Turns out they can actually be observed. They do emit some light in the radio wavelength range, due to the spin-flip of hydrogen's electron. Sometimes, the electron in an atom of hydrogen spontaneously flips its direction of spin. When this happens, the atom goes from a higher energy configuration to a lower energy configuration, releasing energy in the form of a photon of wavelength 21 centimeters as a result. We call this spontaneous flipping of hydrogen's electron the spin-flip of hydrogen. Since there is no visible color associated with the 21 centimeter line, since this wavelength falls in the radio range on the EM spectrum, most images of atomic nebulae are either false colored or digitally composed by intensity mapping. For example, this wide field image of galaxies M81, M82, and NGC 3077 in the constellation Ursa Major is taken in visible wavelengths of light, but it's also been photographed using the 21 centimeter line from the spin flip of neutral hydrogen. We are more likely to see these images of atomic nebulae in this format since photographing them in the visible wavelengths of light is not possible. These are what we call intensity maps, meaning the areas that are darker or more concentrated are the areas with higher 21 centimeter line intensity which goes hand in hand with the amount of neutral hydrogen present in those sections of these atomic nebulae. You may sometimes also see these images composed in false color. Here the red light is color coded red only to indicate that it comes from observations made by the NSF's Robert C. Byrd Green Bank Telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia, and the green light comes from the observations made earlier from the Very Large Array in Socorro, New Mexico. In reality, none of the 21 centimeter light is actually green or red, since it's not visible at all. The last of the ISM that we'll focus on in this video is the molecular nebula. Molecular nebulae are primarily composed of pairs of hydrogen atoms bonded together. Molecular hydrogen. Molecular hydrogen yet again does not emit any visible light of its own, so we have to find other means of detecting and seeing it. Thankfully, we know that there is a decent amount of carbon monoxide in these molecular nebulae as well, so much so that the ratio of carbon monoxide to molecular hydrogen is thought to be constant in our galaxy. This is very convenient because we can actually detect the carbon monoxide at two separate distinct wavelengths, 2.6 millimeters and 1.3 millimeters. If we can see the carbon monoxide clouds and detect them, then chances are that our photographs of the molecular hydrogen shouldn't be too far behind. In this type of situation, carbon monoxide serves as a tracer element for the molecular hydrogen, and that's how we can actually detect these molecular clouds. Now we have to remember these molecular clouds are extremely cold, ranging from 10 to 30 Kelvin in temperature. They comprise less than 1% total of the volume of the ISM in the Milky Way galaxy. And because of their cool temperature, they are almost a thousand times denser than the average of the ISM. When temperature drops, particles tend to clump closer together, and that's exactly what happens in molecular clouds. These molecular clouds can be either a few solar masses in size, but they can get as large as a few million solar masses. 
Those over 10,000 solar masses are generally referred to as giant molecular clouds or GMCs. And it's in these GMCs that star formation can actually occur. The dark dusty strips between the California Nebula on the left and the Pleiades cluster on the right are part of the Perseus molecular cloud. But if we focus our attention on the California Nebula for a second, we can zoom in on the area around it and take a look at the California molecular cloud. But since GMCs like the California molecular cloud are invisible to us in the optical range, we must use tracer molecules like carbon monoxide to see these nebulae. This carbon monoxide emission map is analogous to seeing the inside of a small portion of the California molecular cloud, where stars can actually form in the denser regions of this particular map. Another way of viewing a molecular cloud is to take note of that which we cannot see. The Circinus molecular cloud can be seen here as the dark nebulosity that's shrouding the bright white star in the center in the background. We can see part of the cloud is illuminated by that star, but this part is in the cloud's interior, whereas what we're seeing is the darkness of the side of the cloud that's closer to us. It appears dark because there's no light being emitted from it directly. In fact, the Circinus molecular cloud isn't just in the areas of complete blackness in this image, but rather it encompasses the entire image across your whole screen. Notice that almost all the stars across the image have a reddish tint to them. That's because all of these stars are shining from behind thinner, wispier regions of the Circinus molecular cloud. You can pause the video here on this summary of the properties of the interstellar medium to review it one last time before moving on to the next video.